Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you. And thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I am so proud to stand in this House and speak on such an important issue regarding conversion therapy and why this practice should be banned in Canada. We have seen across this country many provinces and municipalities take appropriate measures to address this issue and steps taken by the federal government to introduce this into the criminal code here in Canada. I have had the honour to participate in multiple conversations with members of the LGBTQ community from coast to coast. I have participated in roundtables, lectures and, of course, your pride parades. Some of my encounters have left an absolutely huge mark on me personally, and those encounters are what will live with me for life and, and what makes me an ally of the LGBTQ2 community. Some of the places that I think of during my visits and these conversations I have, I've spoken about it multiple times, is the OK to be Me program that is in Kitchener, Ontario. I was fortunate enough to go and visit this, this, uh, this group where all of the youth were under the age of 19 and coming in an area from about an hour and a half of that region, coming to talk about who they were and who they are and how they see their futures. Many of them were coming there to have a safe place to have a conversation so they could talk to people who were in similar situations as they, so that they could rely on other people. And I think it's so important that we have these types of organizations and opportunities and programs to allow our youth to be able to talk to people who are in the very, very same situations that they are. Many of them are going through times where they're not expressing who they are to their friends, their families, their teachers, because they are not sure and they are in a lot of self-doubt. Self so open places like the OK to Be Me program is something that I will continue to advocate for. I'm looking across the way and seeing the Deputy House Leader for the Parliament, and, and similar to him, we did grow up in different times. I think of my times growing up in the 80s, and you know, I, I think about the number of friends that I have now who have come out and said, I am gay or I am lesbian. I know at that time back in the 80s growing up, I did not know that one of my best friends was a lesbian. And I think about it today, does it matter? Because I love her to the depths of who she is. She is one of the greatest women in this world that I will know. And it does not matter who she loves, because at the end of the day, I love her for who she is. And I look at the parents, her parents, the way they embraced her. And they love her for who she is. But I do know that when she goes out into the general public, there is that fear of feeling shame. There is that fear of, of not telling people. And as I said, we, I grew up in the 80s where you didn't share this type of information with people. It, it was sort of you were expected to like boys, you know, or you're expected to like this. But the thing is, things have changed and we've become much more aware that we don't all have to fit into that little, little box so that we're all the same. I think of the great work that's also being done by PFLAG. Um, I was actually, a couple years ago, had gone up to Richmond Hill and I sat down with the PFLAG organization where there were children who were in the pr uh, process of transitioning. There were children who had just come out to their parents and they had come to PFLAG with their parents to have these discussions. And we sat down, ate pizza and celebrated somebody's birthday. And it was such an incredible place to be there where everybody felt safe. Everybody felt that they were part of something. And to me, I think about, have I ever felt that way that I wasn't included? I've been very, very fortunate because, you know, I, I'm able to go into places and feel like, hey, I, I'm Karen and, and, I, and that's all good with me. But a lot of people have that self-doubt and that's caused by not being supported for who they actually are. And I think of those people that have to walk alone in this world and how we can actually do better. And for me, making sure that those safe spaces are available, where we can actually talk to, to groups, where places like PFLAG, where parents can sit down with their children. And not that it's a mediation, but it's just a place that you can go and you can listen and you can talk and you can hear about other families' stories of the same challenges that they have gone through. I think it's important that we, as a government, look at those types of programs that we can continue to support. That if we're looking at some more actions that we need to do after the conversion therapy ban is passed, that we have to look at what are those next steps to make sure that we can have this work done. And the reason I say this is we have to look at the mental health component of this. Mental Health Awareness Month, of course, is going on right now. And we have to understand the correlation between mental health and the LGBTQ community. I looked at some of the statistics when I was going through this, and it's, you, you sit back and go, wow, that wasn't me. According to some statistics, one in four LGP members of the LGBTQ community who are students, one in four have been physically harassed 
and six in ten have been verbally abused. Now, think about that, um, you know, you're, you're looking at that. That's meaning over half of the people have been victimized sometimes just because of their sexuality. There is no place for that. We have to look at the fact that they are body shamed, that uh, people of this community have been body shamed. They feel isolated. There's discrimination and bullying that can, occurs. There's the lack of support from some families. We know that every family is not 100% on board, and, and that comes with time as well. And I, I guess I'm very, very hopeful. I am that Pollyanna that believes that we can do better and that we can have hope. So I believe that, you know, helping families go through these challenging times together, we have to be realistic. These things do happen. But we also have to look at the predisposition of mental health challenges as well. Um, I think those are things that, you know, this is something that if somebody is already uncomfortable who they are, it's just adding on to it where their sexuality. So, you know, there's a double, a double prong here that's attacking them. I, I myself, I, I also think of um, a, a couple friends that I sat down with just about a month ago and we were sitting talking about sexuality. And my two friends, uh, partners, uh, Rick and Lee, they don't know I'm talking about them today, but Rick and Lee and I have these really open discussions and it's great because we're in that same generation. And I love to talk to them about music and cooking and everything else. But you know, I, I, after a really broad discussion, I will also say to them, how was it in the 80s growing up? And my one friend, Rick had said, you know something, I wouldn't be here if I came out in the 80s. I would not have been able to survive. Um, he would have probably, well, he stated he would have taken his own life. I think about where we are in 2020 and how can you feel that you would have to take your life because being a member of the LGBTQ community, that, you know, how could you feel so lost and isolated that life isn't worth living and it's just because of your sexuality? That has to be moved out of that frame. That is not, for me, that's not a place that we can be. This is where we do have to understand that love is love. And I will continue to advocate on that. I look at Lee, who was his partner, and they've been married for a number of years, and, and Lee said to me, oh yeah, I dated lots of girls, but as soon as I was done high school, he went on and, and actually was himself. And I think we have to understand that, especially if we're looking at our teens, they are in a fishbowl. When you're in high school, you are in a fishbowl. I went, I went to a school of about 800 students in St. Thomas, Ontario, and you know, everybody knows everybody's business. And once that people are able to get into the real world where there's not 1800 or 800 people walking by and, and seeing what your business are, it may be a little bit easier for them to actually live their freedom and their lifestyle. But we know, especially in those teenage years, that it's really, really difficult. It is such a hard time to fit in as it is. You know, everybody's on Twitter, everybody's on Instagram and Facebook and, and TikTok. I've watched it a couple times, but everybody's on there. And, and life is cycling so quickly right now for our youth that there are already so many, many mental health challenges that they're already coming across. So adding that piece of the sexual orientation, this is something that shouldn't have to be part of that conversation any longer. They should be accepted and they should be loved for who they are. Two minutes? Oh, I could talk for 20, sir. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I just, no. <laughs> it's really bad when my friends on their side are trying to quiet me up because they think I talk so much. But regardless, <laughs> I think that's what makes me a good advocate, oh. is you're, if you're willing to talk, you're willing to have these conversations, that's what it is. And I think when we talk about conversion therapy, there's been a lot of discussions on what that actually is. And I think for myself, talk therapy is what I do. I talk things out. And to some people, they may say that's, con that's a conversion therapy or, or that's that. But for me, the ability to talk, the ability to work through my problems with the people that I love and respect the most is so important, regardless of how difficult those topics are. I know as a parent, I have had multiple difficult situations brought upon me or that I've had to discuss. And you know, we all need that person and that support group around us. So being able to talk is really, really important. I will share because I see that many members, and, and I've heard members of the government also indicate, there is that concern about religion. I'll be honest, I was mad at my husband about six years ago, and the first person I turned to was actually my pastor. You wouldn't see me as a really, really strong uh, religious person, but the pastor was the person that knew me. He knew me and my family sitting in the benches where we sat as a family all the time. 
And to me, I was able to go and speak to him as a confidant. And I think sometimes that's where the confusion will come in this discussion. He wasn't trying to convert me. He was a confidant because he knew who I was. He has seen me actively participate in the church and youth groups and variety of things like that. So I am proud to, and I see that I'm going to be cut off, but I'm proud to speak on this. And I think we should all have this really important discussion because at the end of the day, every life matters, especially that of the LGBTQ community. Thank you.